anyway, with that said, we'll look at verses 18 through 22 here in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Let me read to you those verses, and we'll get into our study. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Peter writes, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the, in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an anti-type which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now, so let me introduce, as I normally do now, it's become my method of teaching. Let me review a few things to lead us up to this point that we're going to be looking at tonight. We've seen how the Apostle Peter has been writing concerning what, what I've, I've read referred to as the duties of believers. And so he had been speaking concerning the duties of believers, but he also had taught concerning how these duties of believers are actually, actually going to make an impact on those who are not believers in Jesus Christ. And so as he was sharing about how we can make the best impact on a watching and unbelieving world, he had begun to emphasize something that I referred to last time as community life as a community life within the church. And, and if we're going to have a community of fellow believers and all, he said we need to have certain things. So he encouraged us to unity, to compassion, to love, to tender, being tender-hearted, and, and, and he exhorted us, encouraged us to patience. He told us that we're to avoid gossip, to avoid backbiting, that we should reject insincerity and, and deceit, which is treachery. He was pointing out that that kind of living will safeguard the body of Christ. It safeguards our unity because it provides a loving and supportive group of fellow believers. And that's especially important during a time of affliction and persecution, which the church is going through at that time. He pointed out that there are those who desire to harm them, but they're not going to succeed. He was saying that the truth, though not always seen, is that followers of good will triumph. And so the key to this is going to be cultivating their understanding of eternity. They're going to endure suffering, but ultimately, there's a reward. Now, in face of the fact that they're going to continue facing afflictions, he said, they must be prepared. They were referred to at that time as superstitious evildoers. That's one of the things that have been said. It's repeated two or three times, three times in First Peter, the term evildoers, it's repeated three times, no less than. And so as evildoers, uh, they had what was called at that time degraded and shameful practices. Under Nero, the Caesar, and this is being written while Caesar was, uh, was, was ruling, they had been called haters, listen to this, haters of the human race. Haters. That's a word we use to this day. That guy's a hater. She's a hater. I mean, that's the same, that's the same concept. They're haters of the human race. Uh, why is that? Well, when they were referring to them as evildoers, this is some of what they were saying. And I did a little more research on what that meant so I could give you a little more about it. Now, what was it about these believers that made these Romans so upset at them to the point where they would say, these are evildoers, these are haters? Well, they said... These are followers of a rebel criminal, a man by the name of Jesus Christ who was executed for his crime. I wonder how many of you have heard of Ben Shapiro. Raise your hand. A lot of you have, have heard of Ben Shapiro. Ben Shapiro was asked, why was Jesus Christ crucified? And you know what his answer was? It's because he was a rebel and uh, it was because he was a criminal. I heard him say that. That's a quote, basically. That is not a new thing to say about Jesus Christ. As much as you may appreciate, as I do, so much of his insights. 
That's how he looks at Jesus Christ, that he was a rebel and a criminal. And he was executed, he said, for his crimes. And so that's not new. That's all the way back 2,000 years ago when the Romans said Christians are evildoers. Not only that, but because they believed in the Spirit giving us utterance of prophecy or prophetic utterances, they believed that they were magicians practicing magical arts because they were teaching about what was going to happen in the future. They were called disloyal revolutionaries because they disrespected the traditional values and morals of a corrupt culture. They undermined the culture because they pretended. These are all things that were said because they were pretending to live apart from the culture and so that they're just hypocrites and they're undermining culture. Not only that, but they gave slaves a false hope. They were telling them that their reward was great and could be even greater than their masters. And so these were things that were being said about believers at that time. So Peter told them to set themselves apart for God. He taught them to be prepared, to be able to share the good news of the gospel. He said, you need to have a clean conscience because if your conscience is clean, you have integrity. And even though you're experiencing suffering, He said, it's better to suffer for doing good than to suffer for doing evil. And so that's what he's been saying up to this point. That brings us up to where he is now continuing his encouragement to the believers. And how is he going to encourage believers are going through suffering? How is he going to do that? Well, notice verse 18, how he begins. He says, Christ also suffered. Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Christ also suffered... You may be suffering, and you may be innocent, but you're not alone, is what he's saying. You're not alone in your suffering. Remember, he's saying that Jesus suffered, and by the way, much more than you ever will or ever could. When you begin to read the Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah and what he went through, and I'm not going to take you through through much. I'll I'll take you to a couple of, of places. Isaiah, for example, The Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 6. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. We know that that took place the night that Jesus was taken before Pontius Pilate and all that he went through on that night. In Isaiah 52, 13 and 14, see, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up. Highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. Listen, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. When you hear of the beating that Jesus suffered, the pulling out of the beard, the breaking of his back with with the, the lashes and all of that, those are points that Jesus suffered And Peter is pointing that. He said, Christ also suffered. You may be innocent and you may be unjustly treated. You're not alone, he's saying. Jesus also suffered. And the idea when he speaks of this, by the way, Christ also suffered. The idea of the word suffered is that he suffered to the point of dying. He's saying, you suffered. But remember, and this is an important point. Even if you do suffer to death, you're going to enter into glory. You will enter into glory. That's why, that's why Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, could say this, Oh, death, where's your victory? Where, oh, death, is your sting? Because he's saying, remember, Jesus suffered. You may be suffering. Jesus suffered like no other man. You are suffering. Jesus died. You may die. But he entered into glory. And because of of your faith in him, you will too. Jesus died. Now notice he says in verse 18, Christ suffered once, once for sins, the just for the unjust. So as he's bringing comfort, he says, this will comfort you. Um, Death only occurs once. You don't have to do it a second time. It only occurs once. 
See, these, these who believe in reincarnation have never really understood that. You know, one death is enough. One death's enough. And who wants to come back as a mosquito? I mean, there's so many things that you have to think about when you believe in things, things like that. Well, the Bible says it is appointed unto men to die once and after this judgment. So for Jesus, in his case, his death was what we call substitutionary. He died. He suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. He, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When Paul was writing to the Romans in chapter 5, verse 8, he said, God demonstrated his, his own kind of love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so he's pointing out to us that the Lamb of God has taken away the sin. Jesus died on our behalf, and he is the just. That word just means righteous. He is the one who is righteous. He gave his life to save us, we who are the unrighteous. Romans 4.25, he was delivered over to death for our trespasses, but he was raised to life for our justification. So he died, he said. He died once for sins. In Hebrews 10, verse 10, the writer said, God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. He died one time for all time. And the death of Jesus is non-repeatable. Again, it's a one time for all time. Hebrews 9, 25 through 28 says it like this. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood, that's not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away sins of the people. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are awaiting him. And so he died one time for all time, the just for the unjust. I was raised in the Catholic Church. How many of you were? I, I'm, I've never really, I never, a number of you were. Then you may understand this if you went to catechism. How many of you went to catechism? There you go. Okay, because uh, well, some of you were just baptized. But anyway, <laughs> you weren't hardcore. Um, in the sacrifice of the Mass, you know how we refer to it, and I'll say this briefly, you know it's called the Mass, right? Everybody knows the Mass, every ex-Catholic knows it, right? The Mass, it's, it's actually called the sacrifice of the Mass. You remember that? It's not called the Mass, it's the sacrifice of the Mass. Why is it that? Because every time you have communion, it's a re-crucifixion of Jesus Christ, every time. Because the Catholic Church teaches the actual presence and body of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We were taught that, that that wafer becomes the actual body and that the wine is made into the actual blood. Some of you remember this. I would not, you could not bite the wafer because that was his body. So you had to let it dissolve, right? And I got scared. I was seven years old. I'm thinking if I bite this, blood will come in my mouth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get sick. You know, I, I error. that's error. Jesus not, is not re-crucified. He died one time for all time, the just for the unjust. And so that mass really is unscriptural. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, that Christ died for our sins. He suffered once for our sins, that he might bring us to God. In Romans 4.25, he was delivered over to death for our sins, was raised to life for our justification. So, verse 18, second portion, being put to death in the flesh, he was made alive by the Spirit. Now, when it says being put to death in the flesh, the flesh is speaking of his physical body. It's speaking that he actually physically died. So, being put to death in the flesh. Remember John 1.14, how... John said, the word became flesh. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And then verse 14, uh, John 1, 1, I just quoted that. But John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. 
And we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And so that's speaking of incarnation. When it says speaking of um, being put to death in the flesh, he's, he, he's speaking of the fact that he physically died, that Jesus physically died. But he was raised from the dead, but made alive by the spirit. He was raised from the dead by the spirit of God. So when it says that he was made alive, made alive speaks of his physical resurrection. So he physically died, but he physically resurrected. In John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken, Jesus said, the words I've spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. In Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And so he's pointing out that Jesus was actually physically put to death, but he was made alive by the Spirit of God. Now, here's the most very interesting portions of Scripture that you're going to find in the New Testament. And uh, let's attempt to look at this and make sense of it. Verse 19, it had said, made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So he went and spoke to John. <laughs> who, formerly were, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. This is one of those deeper portions of Scripture. It's very difficult for me to comprehend, and so I'm going to do my best to communicate to you the little that I can grasp from the depth of this particular portion of Scripture. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? This gives us a part of the answer here. That's a question people ask, well, was he, he was in the grave three days. What happened in between his burial and his resurrection? Peter gives us some insight and gives us somewhat of an answer for that. Because he says again in verse nine, 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, when it says by whom, you have to ask yourself, which spirit is he, is he referring to when it speaks of that? Uh, which spirit, what spirits, what prison? So there are various ways that very competent and scholarly commentators approach this, and I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts about it that I gleaned from, from when I was studying on this. And I'll begin again with verse 19 when it says, By whom he went and preached. Now, many commentators believe that he's speaking about, and you'll see this in a moment, I'll develop this with you, but many commentators believe he's speaking about the preaching by Noah. The preaching by Noah. Peter would be speaking of the spirit of Jesus Christ who inspires the preaching of Noah so long ago. Now, we saw something like that. If you want to turn your, your Bible for just a second back to the first chapter of 1 Peter, and I'll show you this. We saw something that would lend itself to that in 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice verse 11 when Peter said, well, I'll read verses 10 and 11. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. And so by looking back at that verse and moving back into chapter 3, um, Peter is saying that the Spirit of Christ was the one who inspired the prophets. And this will take a moment to develop. Peter says something like that in 2 Peter in chapter 2, verse 5, when it says that he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. So Noah is a preacher of righteousness. Noah is preached under the inspiration of the Spirit of Christ. And so we have part of the answer. Now, who is he speaking to? 
Notice again in verse 19, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Who would he be speaking to? I don't know. Let's keep going. No. <laughs> that would mean he is speaking of the spirits or the people of the days of Noah who perished. Noah, a preacher of righteousness, preached a flood and judgment is coming. We all know the story. But there were only eight people altogether, Noah and his household, that went into the ark. And the entire population of the world at that time suffered and died. In the dr they drowned when the judgment of God came. So it would be referring to the human beings, if you will, who rejected the message and they are being they are awaiting judgment. And so that is one of the approaches. Now, there's another one. I don't want to confuse you by giving you too much, but why not? <laughs> there are others who will say that this speaks of the fallen angels who were alive during the time of Noah. And you see that in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 especially. So the scripture says, in the days of Noah... Noah, they filled the earth with violence, with sexual sin, and unbelief. In Genesis 6, verse 5, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So there was violence, sexual sin, unbelief. They were judged in the flood, and God imprisoned the most vile of the demonic spirits who were in existence at that time, inhabiting men and actually having relations with women. And they would have been the most vile of the vile. And so since Noah's time, they've been bound because of their unspeakable evil, commentators would say. Now, they're, they're being imprisoned. When it says in verse 19, spirits in prison, let me give you a little bit about that for a moment. This prison is, is what would be called a preliminary place of incarceration, a holding cell, if you will. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. It's a word called uh, Tartarus. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Jude, verse 6, the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So, there are commentators who would say between Jesus' death and resurrection, he spoke to the demons in the abyss. Now, verse 19, when it says he went and preached to the spirits, that's where people can get confused. The word preached there is not preaching as if you're preaching the gospel. The word preach, if you look it up in, if you have Greek helps or anything, I have, I have those at my disposal. You'll see that the word preach there is not speaking of preaching a message. It's speaking of proclaiming victory. It's a proclamation is what he's doing. And it, it would be saying that between his death and resurrection, he spoke to the demons who were incarcerated. He entered into this temporary place and pronounced their doom. He proclaimed his victory as well as his triumph over them. He announced his triumph over sin, over death, over the grave, over the demons, as well as Satan. Now, why would that be significant? And why would that be something that's possible as we look at this? Well, ever since the fall... There is a conflict between God and Satan. It's even referred to, to, to this day. They just speak as, well, there's a battle between good and evil. Now, when he went and preached, again, the commentator would say he was proclaiming victory. Why would that? Well, because evil demons may have thought that by the death of Jesus, they had won. They had won. And so Jesus was saying to them, you lost. You lost. Uh, why is that? Well, there's so many scriptures. I only give you one. Acts 2.27, 
how the psalmist uh, had said, concerning Messiah, you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. So you thought that you had victory. You may be thinking that, that you won. You didn't win. Because Jesus died, the just for the unjust, in order that we might have life in him. He defeated the grave. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And he proclaims his victory to those who thought he lost. That kind of spirit still exists in the world to this day, though. Because Christians very often, maybe not all Christians, but some, many of the leaders of the body of Christ, pastors and all, we're called foolish and stupid because we actually believe that Jesus did that. You believe in a guy who died and you're trying to tell me he came back to life again? Please, please. How could that be so? I could see the, those little dumb sheep that you lead. Maybe they'll believe because they're not thinking. But you, you claim to spend time reading and studying. How can you believe that? That attitude is still here. That attitude is still here. It is foolishness to those who don't believe. The gospel makes no sense. Why should I believe that there's a God? Why should I believe that there's a God who loves? You see, when you take the evolutionary model, and I'll do this briefly, when you... Take the evolutionary model. What does the evolutionary model give to us? Well, one of the things that people will tell you about it is that the, that the more powerful prey on the weaker, right? The more powerful will prey on the weaker. If you've got a lion and a lamb, who's going to win the fight, right? The more powerful will always take advantage of the weaker. That's just the, they used to call it the law of the jungle. That's just the way it is. Even human beings are that way. You go into a room, you've got several guys there. The baddest guy wants to prove he's bad, and all the weaker ones, they, go, they, they, get, they get beat up and, and punked and this and that. That's what happens. That's a fact. Why is that? Because the stronger always, always picks on the weaker. Always. Always. Well, wait a minute now. Who is the most powerful being in the universe if it's not God? God is the most powerful. Well, wait a minute. If I follow the evolutionary chain, then I have to say that the most powerful being would also be the most fierce and harsh and a bully. And it is not. That's what blows people's minds because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That Jesus Christ, who is the Lion of Judah, is the Lamb of God. And that doesn't make sense to the world because the greater always preys on the weaker. And yet this great one here has loved us and yielded himself for us so that we could have life, so we could have joy, so we could have peace, so we could have love, so we could have hope. Oh, that's amazing. And the demons, because they come from this hierarchical system where the enemy, the prince of demons, Satan, it's all cruelty from the top down. He's a murderer, Jesus said, from the beginning. He's a liar and the father of lies. And in him is no truth whatsoever. And his demons are like him. So naturally, it makes some, a bit of sense that they could think, we won. You died. And Jesus is saying, no, I was dead and yet I live. And you have lost. And that's the gospel in a nutshell. He proclaimed his victory. Now, these who may be thinking that they got over on him, they didn't. Because ultimately, they're sent to the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 10 says, The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Matthew 25, 41 says, He will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. People say, how could God have a hell for people? Hell was not created for people. Hell was not intended for people. Hell is intended to bring judgment on the devil and his angels. So the only way you can go to hell is over Jesus' dead body. 
That's the only way. And that's why he gave up his life for you. So you wouldn't go to hell. It's not like he chose you to go to hell. It's that by refusing his love, you choose, you choose to go yourself. But that's why we Christians call the world to repentance. That's why we do. Because we don't want them to go to a place of judgment. With that said, moving on, verse 21. There is also an anti antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And so baptism, I want you to see this. First, he says there is also an anti-type. We don't use that word very often. I didn't use it today uh, other than just now when I read it. The word anti-type is speaking of a figure. It's a symbol. There's a symbol which now saves us. And then he tells us what this figure, the symbol is. It's baptism. <laughs> but notice how he says that it's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not a bath. Now, again, I'll say this briefly. In Israel, when you go to Israel, they have what they call mikvahs. They have their, their uh, ritual baths. And in Israel... The, there, there were times when, when uh, people uh, would take this bath and it was symbolic of cleansing um, because that's, a, that's an acknowledgement of uh, the fact that you need to be purified or you need to be cleansed. And so he's saying it's not the removal of the filth from the flesh. It's not taking a bath. It's not just climbing in the water and, and, and having the, the, the day's dust washed off of you. Peter is not saying that water baptism, and I'll develop this, he's not saying that water baptism saves us. Now, again, there are those who believe in something called baptismal regeneration. I'm giving you different things than normal. Baptismal regeneration is the doctrine that requires water baptism. And if you haven't been water baptized, you will not go to heaven. You have to, according to certain doctrines, there are different churches that preach this, unless you are water baptized, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. He is not saying that water baptism saves us. It's interesting how Paul said something like this, 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, verse 17. It's interesting how Paul said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. He didn't send me out to baptize. Why? Because baptism doesn't save you. What will save you? Preaching the gospel and applying faith to the words of the gospel and being, being born again. It's not water that cleanses you. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So it's not water whatsoever. That's why when, when we're saying we're going to have a baptism, that's why John has said this in, in a joking fashion, of course, but mm, your first one didn't count. What's that mean? What are you saying? I'll tell you what he's saying. He's saying, I want to be fired. No, he's saying, <laughs> he, he's saying that some of us, again, I have Catholics in this room, ex-Catholics, I'm assuming. Um, I was water baptized when I was three months old. That's a washing of water was I saved no we were water baptized children in, as infants that's what we were did that save me no and so it's not the washing of the flesh it's a clean conscience and the clean conscience comes through the blood of Christ it comes from receiving Christ as Lord and Savior and receiving forgiveness and so baptism is is the picture of total identification with the death burial burial and resurrection of Christ. And it represents, it's a visible representation of our new life in Jesus. It's a picture of us taking on newness in Christ. When you are water baptized, uh, baptized, you go into the water, which is a picture of death, burial. But when you come out, it's a picture of resurrection. You'll see this, those who are getting baptized in August. I'll be sharing this out of Romans 6. It's a picture of death, burial, 
and resurrection. That's what it is. It's a picture of salvation and our identification with the Lord. And because we have been saved, we have a good conscience. Now, remember in Matthew 28 and verse 19, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the nations. So the disciples, the church, is to go out and make disciples throughout the world. And he said, uh, if you believe and are baptized, uh, then, then you'll be my, my disciple. In Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So it's by believing, it's through faith that we have a clean conscience. Now, Peter says this is the answer of a good conscience. So when he speaks of a good conscience, and I'll touch that for just a moment, when he speaks of a good conscience, that's an inward work. It's a renewing of our inner person by grace. In Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls, the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think. How much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. He went on in chapter 10, verse 22 in Hebrews to say, let us continue to come near with sincere hearts in the full assurance that faith provides because our hearts have been sprinkled clean from a guilty conscience. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. I can't tell you how my conscience, and I, I, I think I can speak for all of us, how my conscience was so guilty. I needed, I needed, I needed it to be cleansed. I, I needed a cleansing because no matter how I tried to be good, I couldn't succeed in it, and I couldn't forget the things that I'd done. And I, and I lived in such a, I had grown to live in such a guilt over the things that I had done and how I'd hurt people and all of that garbage that was part of my old life. But there was nothing I could do to make myself better. And then I came to faith in Christ and he cleansed my filthy conscience by his blood. And he made me a brand new person. And he forgave everything I'd done. And he made me brand new. And I've said this before, but... He was so kind to, to give to me a, a, a girl named Marie who would never have even looked at me before Christ, never wanted to be with someone like me. And he changed me so completely that a good person like her could be attracted to a new person like me. And that's what God does. He changes you. It doesn't necessarily mean on the outside. He changes you from the inside. And that joy that he brings into your life is a transforming, transforming joy that comes through the grace of God. Now, Noah and his family were saved because they were in the ark. And that's what he's saying here in verse 21. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved. So being in the ark saved his family According to Genesis 6, verse 8, Noah had found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and he had believed God. He had acted on his faith, and as a result, he had been saved because they were in that ark in obedience to what God had said. So being in the ark saved him and his family from physical death, but being in Christ now saves us because he's our security. He's the one who saves us from the judgment. And so being in the ark, as Noah was, is a picture of us being in Christ who saves us. In verse 22, he says, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. So this is, in, this is completing his encouragement to us, his readers. He's saying, Jesus suffered, and so were they, and so can we. Jesus went through rejection. He went through injury, and ultimately he died. But the result was glory. And he was making it clear, and this is something we need to hear. The suffering they're enduring results in glory. In 2 Corinthians 4.17, this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So Jesus died, he was buried, but he also ascended. And Peter saw Jesus ascend into heaven. Remember in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verse 11, 
Now Jesus said to them, men of Galilee, uh, the angels said rather, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So Jesus ascended into heaven, and it says he is seated at the right hand of God. In Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said, My Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Right hand. Sit at my right hand. The right hand of God is used, that phrase, the right hand of God, is used eight, about eight times in the New Testament. The right hand of God is speaking of a place of authority. In Matthew 26, verse 64, uh, Jesus said, You have said it yourself, nevertheless I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds. So Jesus is supreme over angels, authorities, and all power. Ephesians 1, 20 and 21, God raised Jesus from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Psalm 8, verse 6, you made him ruler of the works of your hands. You have placed everything under his feet. When you read Revelation in chapter 5, it says in verses 11 and 12, I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. I've said this before. As I read this, it makes me Remember, if you don't enjoy worshiping God here on earth, heaven's no place for you. Because that's what you're going to do. One of these days, and it's really not that far away, we're going to hear the voice of the Lord. I don't know what he'll say, but perhaps he'll say, come up here. And then we'll be with him. And we're going to be, be, be I, hope you, I hope you can see this. I, I want to see this. And what I mean by that is I want, to, I, want to, I want to see it more clearly in my faith. Being around the throne with multitudes. Multitudes. Can you imagine the... The reunion... See, I'm getting carried away. I'm starting to picture it in my own mind. I have to slow down and, and go back. Because one of these days, when we're there worshiping God, you're going to see friends who've gone to be with the Lord in heaven that you haven't seen because they're gone. You're going to see, if you had to believe in Mama, you're going to see Mama again. And she's not going to hit you with her shoe. <laughs> That's nice. And you'll see, if you had a believing dad, you'll see your daddy. If you lost a child, you're going to meet your child. Friends and family, you're going to see the men and women of Scripture that inspired your life. You'll see, there's Abraham. You're going to go punch Adam. Why did you mess up? <laughs> Eve, ah. You're hot, but I wouldn't have gone to hell for you. <laughs> she had to be. She had to be. Can you imagine that? If worshiping God is boring, maybe heaven's not for you. But being there unburdened, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. Everything swallowed up in life. To put your arm around a friend, to meet your baby that you lost. I 
I believe I have between eight to ten grandchildren that we've lost through miscarriages. I have a child that was ours. We lost through miscarriage. I will see them one day. I'll meet my own grandchildren and my own baby. That touches me because it's real. Because it's real. And we'll have our hands up and we'll worship him and we're not going to worry about our, our voices. <laughs> and we'll tell him, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. That's what we'll say. You've come. You've come. Honor and glory and blessing. The gospel warning of judgment and death is countered by life in Jesus through faith. And though you have been persecuted and though you've been harmed by man, you will triumph in, in Jesus Christ. And it will all have been worth it. Christ suffered for us once for all. You will suffer too. But it is not a suffering without a purpose. And God will show himself strong on your behalf. And one day you'll see him face to face.